So you've all f heard about the obesity epidemic. Here are the numbers. The obese are getting obeser. Of course, that's true. But in fact, the entire curve has shifted. We all weigh 25 pounds more today than we did 25 years ago, all of us. Now, it is often said that obesity is the ultimate interaction between genetics and environment. Our genetic pool did not change in the last 30 years, but boy, oh boy, has our environment sure changed. Okay? So tonight, we're going to talk about the environment rather than genes. Okay? You're all familiar with the basic concept of the first law of thermodynamics, which states that the total energy inside a closed system remains constant. If you eat it, you better burn it, or you're gonna store it. I used to believe that. I don't anymore. I think that's a mistake. I think that is the biggest mistake, and that is the uh, phenomenon I'm going to try to debunk over the course of the, uh, over the next hour. Why are the Chinese? Why are the Koreans? Why are the Australians? All these countries who've adopted our diet all suffer now from the same problem. If you're gonna store it, that is an obligate weight gain set up by a biochemical process, and you expect to burn it, that is normal energy expenditure for normal quality of life, then you're gonna have to eat it. And now all of a sudden, these two behaviors, the gluttony and the sloth, are actually secondary to a biochemical process, which is primary. And that's a different way to think about the process, and it also alleviates the obese person from being the perpetrator, but rather the victim which is how obese people really feel, because no one chooses to be obese. Certainly no child chooses to be obese, but the kids I take care of in uh, obesity clinic do not choose to be obese. In fact, this is the exception that proves the rule. We have an epidemic of obese six-month-olds. Now, if you want to say that it's all about diet and exercise, then you have to explain this to me. So any hypothesis that you want to proffer that explains the obesity epidemic, you've got to explain this one too. Okay? And this is not just in America, these six-month-old obese kids, but these are around the world now. Sure enough, we are all eating more now than we did 20 years ago. No question. We're all eating more. Question is, why? There's a system in our body, which you've heard about over the last couple of weeks, called leptin. Everybody heard of leptin? Okay? It's this hormone that comes from your fat cell, tells your brain, you know what, I've had enough. I don't need to eat anymore. I'm done. And I can burn energy properly. Well, you know what? If you're eating 187 or 335 calories more today than you were 20 years ago, your leptin ain't working. Because if it were, you wouldn't be doing it, whether the food was there or not. So there's something wrong with our biochemical negative feedback system that normally controls energy balance. It's all in the carbohydrate. 57 grams, 228 calories. We're all eating more carbohydrate. Look what's happened to the obesity, metabolic syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease, stroke prevalence, all jacked way up as our total fat consumption as a percent has gone down. The carbohydrate, specifically, which carbohydrate? Well, beverage intake, right? 41% increase in soft drinks, 35% increase in fruit drinks, fruit aids, whatever you want to call them. The question is, how come we don't respond? How come leptin doesn't work? How come we can't stay energy stable? That's what we're going to get to. So I call this slide very specifically the Coca-Cola conspiracy. So why do I call it the Coca-Cola conspiracy? Well, what's in Coke? Caffeine, good, good. So what's caffeine? It's a mild stimulant, right? It's also a diuretic, right? Makes you pee free water. What else is in Coke? We'll get to the sugar in a minute. What else? Salt. Salt. 55 milligrams of sodium per can. It's like drinking a pizza. So what happens if you take on sodium and lose free water? You get thirstier, right? So why is there so much sugar in Coke? to hide the salt. When was the last time you went to a Chinese restaurant and had sweet and sour pork? That's half soy sauce, you wouldn't eat that. Except the sugar plays a trick on your tongue, you can't even tell it's there, right? Everybody remember New Coke, 1985? Yeah. More salt, more caffeine. They knew what they were doing, okay? That's the smoking gun, okay? They know, they know. 
All right, so that's why it's the Coca-Cola conspiracy. So are soft drinks the cause of obesity? Well, it depends on who you ask. If you ask the scientists for the National Soft Drink Association, they'll tell you there's absolutely no association between sugar consumption and obesity. Okay? If you ask my colleague, Dr. David Ludwig, each additional sugared sweetened drink increase over a 19-month follow-up period in kids increased their BMI by this much and their odds risk ratio for obesity by 60%. 88 cross-sectional and longitudinal studies regressing soft drink consumption against energy intake, body weight, milk and calcium intake, adequate nutrition, all showing significant uh, associations, and some of these being longitudinal. This came from Kelly Brownell's group at Yale. Okay? I should comment, I should, disclaimer, those studies that were funded by the beverage industry showed consistently smaller effects than those that were independent. Wonder why. So what's in soft drinks? Well, in America, it's this stuff, right? High fructose corn syrup. Everybody's heard of it, right? This is something we were never exposed to before, 1975. And currently, we are consuming 63 pounds per person per year, every one of us. 63 pounds of high fructose corn syrup. That's American? That's American, yes. Now, what is high fructose corn syrup? Well, it's one glucose, one fructose. We'll talk about those at great length. One of the reasons we use high fructose corn syrup is because it's sweeter. So here's sucrose. This is caner beet sugar, standard table sugar, you know, the white stuff, okay? And we give that an index and sweetness of 100. So here's high fructose corn syrup. It's actually sweeter. It's about 120. So you should be able to use less, right? Wrong. We use just as much. In fact, we use more. It's also cheaper, as I'll show you. So here's high fructose corn syrup. One glucose, one fructose. Notice the glucose is a six-membered ring. The fructose is a five-membered ring. They are not the same, believe me. They're not the same. That's what this whole talk is about, is how they're not the same. Okay? And here's sucrose, and they're just bound together by this ether linkage. We have this enzyme in our uh, gut called sucrase. It kills, it kills that bond in two seconds flat, okay, and you absorb it. And basically, high fructose corn syrup, sucrose, it's a non-issue. It's a wash. They're the same. They're both equally bad. Okay? They're both dangerous. They're both poison. Okay, I said it, poison. My charge before the end of tonight is to demonstrate that fructose is a poison. Okay, so they're talking about soda like it's empty calories. I'm here to tell you that it goes way beyond empty calories. Okay, the reason why this is a problem is because fructose is a poison. Okay, it's not about the calories. It's not, has nothing to do with the calories. It's a poison by itself. And I'm going to show you that. So here's the secular trend in fructose consumption over the past 100 years. Before we had food processing, we used to get our fructose from fruits and vegetables. And if we did that today, we would consume about 15 grams per day of fructose. Not sugar, fructose. So fr sugar would be 30 grams, it would be double. Okay, We're just talking about fructose today. 25% of the um, adolescents today consume at least 15% of their calories from fructose alone. This is a disaster. So this is where the politics comes in. This is the perfect storm. The first political wind, everything bad that ever happened in this country started with one man, and it's still being felt today. Okay? So Richard Nixon, in his paranoia back in 1972, okay, Food prices were going up and down and up and down. I'm going to show you that on the next slide. Okay? And he was worried that this was actually going to cost him the election. So he admonished his Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Rusty Butts, I love that name, okay? <laughs> to f basically take food off the political table, to make food a non-issue in presidential elections. Well, the only way to do that was to make food cheap. So he was out to find all methods to be able to decrease the price of food. Remember Nixon's war on poverty? This, we're suffering from it today. Okay? That's what this is. Okay? Second political win, the advent of high fructose corn syrup. Okay? So this was invented in 1966 at Saga Medical School in Japan by a guy named Takasaki, who's still alive. It was introduced to the American market in 1975. So what do you think happened to the price of sugar when this thing hit the market? 
Here's where corn sweeteners entered the market, 1975, 1980, and you can see that since then, the price of sugar has remained remarkably constant. And it did so not just in the US, but also on the international stage. Here's the London price doing the same thing. And when you look at the difference in price between uh, sugar and high fructose corn syrup, you can see that high fructose corn syrup is about half the price. Okay? So in other words, it's cheap, it's so cheap that it's found its way into everything. It's found its way into hamburger buns, pretzels, barbecue sauce and ketchup, okay? almost everything. Okay? So we are being poisoned by this stuff and it's been added surreptitiously to all of our food, every processed food. The third political storm that happened in 1982 the USDA, the American Heart Association, the American Medical Association, all telling us we had to reduce our consumption of fat. Now, why did they tell us that? To stop what? To stop heart disease, did we? No, we didn't, did we? Okay. In fact, it's worked the exact opposite. We've only created more. Home-cooked food that you cook by yourself in your house, you can control the content of fat. Okay? But when you process it, low-fat processed food, it tastes like cardboard. The food companies knew that, so what did they do? They had to make it palatable. So how do you make it something palatable that has no fat in it? You add the sugar. So two grams of fat down, 13 grams of carbohydrate up, four of them being sugars, so that it was palatable. Through the addition of fructose for palatability, especially because of the decreased fat, and also as a ostensibly browning agent, which actually has its own issues, okay? And removal of fiber also. Now, why did we remove fiber from our diet? Well, it takes too long to cook, takes too long to eat, and shelf life, okay? So the, people ask me, what's the definition of fast food? Fiberless food. And then finally, the last issue was the substitution of trans fats, which are clearly a disaster. But those have been going down because we know that those are a problem. Okay, now to the biochemistry. And let me show you why fructose is not glucose. Okay, because what the liver does to fructose is really unique, and you've got to understand it to understand everything I've just told you. Okay, so number one, fructose is seven times more likely than glucose to do that browning reaction, the advanced glycosylation end products. The thing that happens on your grill happens in your arteries for the same reason. Okay, you can actually see the color too, the color change too. Fructose does not suppress the hunger hormone. There's a hormone that comes from your stomach called ghrelin you've heard about already. If you preload a kid with a can of soda and then you let them loose at the fast food restaurant, they eat more. They just took on 150 calories, yet they eat more. Reason? Because fructose doesn't suppress the hunger hormone ghrelin. So they eat more. Acute fructose ingestion does not stimulate insulin because there's no receptor for fructose, no transporter for fructose on the beta cell that makes insulin. So the insulin doesn't go up. Well, if the insulin doesn't go up, then leptin doesn't go up. And if leptin doesn't go up, your brain doesn't see that you ate something. Therefore, you eat more. And finally, I'm going to show you liver hepatic fructose metabolism is completely different between fructose and glucose. Completely different. Chronic fructose exposure alone, nothing else, causes this thing we call the metabolic syndrome. Everybody knows what the metabolic syndrome is? Okay, so this is the conglomerate of the following different uh, phenomena. Obesity, type two diabetes, lipid problems, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. Okay, those all cluster together, okay, called metabolic syndrome. I'm gonna show you how fructose does every one of those. I wanna show you the difference between glucose and fructose in a way that will be glaringly apparent. So let's consume 120 calories in glucose two slices of white bread, okay? What happens to that 120 calories? Now, you eat the 120 calories, 96 or 80% of the total will be used by all the organs in the body, okay? 80% off the table. Why? Because every cell in the body can use glucose. Every bacteria can use glucose. Every living thing on the face of the earth can use glucose because glucose is the energy of life. Okay? That's what we were supposed to eat. Okay? 24 of those calories, or 20%, will hit the liver. Okay? So let's watch what happens to those 24 calories. Here they go. So the glucose comes in through this transporter called GLUT2, 
Out here, the glucose is going to stimulate the pancreas to make insulin. The insulin is going to bind to its receptor, and it's going to take this substrate over here called IRS1, insulin receptor substrate 1. That's not important right now. Don't worry. Okay? And it's going to tyrosine phosphorylate it. Okay? And it's going to be tyrosine IRS1, which is now active. That's active. And it's going to stimulate the second messenger here called AKT. Okay? Now, what AKT does is it stimulates this guy down here, SREBP1, sterol receptor binding protein number one. Don't worry about it. Okay? But this is the thing that ultimately gets fat uh, mechanics going. And that serves as a substrate for adipose deposition into your fat cell here, triglyceride. In addition, because the insulin went up in response to the glucose, your brain sees that, res that, that, that signal, and it knows that that is supposed to shut off further eating. Okay? In other words, hey, I'm busy metabolizing my breakfast. I don't need lunch. Okay? And so you have a nice negative feedback loop between glucose consumption, the liver, the pancreas, and the brain to keep you in normal, negative, yin-yang energy balance. This is good. This is not dangerous. This is what's supposed to happen. All right, so now let's talk about a different carbohydrate. Here's the... Structure, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, it's a carbohydrate. But we all know that ethanol is a toxin, right? A poison. We have 1,500 years of alcohol control policy in this, in, in this world to draw on in terms of how to limit consumption. Got it? Okay, because ethanol is a toxin and we know it. So let's consume 120 calories in ethanol. Shot a maker's mark. So. 24 calories right off the top, okay? The stomach and the intestine have something called the first pass effect, so 10% off the top, and kidney, muscle, and brain will consume the other 10%. So there goes 20% or 24 calories right off the top. 96 calories of the 120 are gonna hit the liver. Now, how many was it for glucose? It was 24, okay? So four times the substrate is gonna hit the liver, and there's the rub, okay? This is a volume issue. So, the ethanol comes in, passive diffusion, there's no receptor for it, no transporter. First thing that happens is ethanol gets converted to this guy over here called acetaldehyde. Okay? Anybody know anything about aldehydes? Like formaldehyde? Right? Are aldehydes good for you or bad for you? They're bad, right? Because what do they do? They can cause cancer. They cross-link proteins is what they do. Okay? So if you cross-link enough proteins in your liver, what do you think happens to it? You get something called cirrhosis. Right, exactly. All right? So this guy over here is bad. Okay? And it generates something called reactive oxygen species. And reactive oxygen species damage proteins in the liver. And the more alcohol you drink, the more of this stuff you get. So far, so good? Okay, so this is one of the reasons why alcohol is bad. Now, the acetaldehyde will come down here to something called acetate. Okay, the acetate will enter the mitochondria, just like the pyruvate did before. We'll get converted to acetyl-CoA and participate in the TCA cycle, just like before, okay, to generate energy. Okay? They're going to have a whole lot of citrate, right? because they have 96 calories that have to get metabolized. How many calories made it to the mitochondria with glucose? About a half, right? because most of it went to glycogen. So we've got a big citrate, so it's in big font to show you that we've talked about big citrate now. Okay? And so the big citrate is going to get metabolized all the way to VLDL by this SRBP1. And so you're going to get a lot of VLDL. And this is the dyslipidemia of alcoholism right here. So when you generate junk one, you do bad things to your liver, which I will show you when we talk about fructose. So let's talk about fructose. Okay? Fructose is sweet. We like it a lot. Okay, we like it in everything. We like it in our bread. We like it in our pretzels. We like it everywhere we look. Okay? So let's consume 120 calories in sucrose, a glass of orange juice, two slices of white bread, a shot of Maker's Mark, a glass of orange juice, all the same 120 calories, but three different substrates. Let's see what happens to the fructose. So number one, the glucose Remember, because sucrose is half glucose, half fructose. So 60 of the calories of the 120 are glucose. 12 are going to make it into the liver. 48 out here for the rest of the body. Okay, The same 20-80 split we had before with glucose. So far, so good. 
but all 60 calories of fructose are gonna be metabolized by the liver. Why? Because only the liver can metabolize fructose. So what do we call it where when you take in a, a compound that's foreign to your body and only the liver can metabolize it and in the process generates various problems, what do we call that? We call that a poison. So the fructose comes in through this transporter now. Before it was GLUT2, now it's GLUT5, okay? No insulin, remember, because fructose does not stimulate insulin. Now, before we had 24 calories that had to be phosphorylated. Now we have 72 calories that have to be phosphorylated. So we have three times the substrate, and there's the rub. It's a volume issue for right now. So we're gonna lose a lot of phosphate, aren't we? So there's a scavenger enzyme in your liver called AMP deaminase 1 to rescue the phosphates off the rest of the ATP molecule. And it takes ADP down to AMP, adenosine monophosphate, down to IMP, inositol monophosphate, and finally to the waste product, uric acid. Anybody ever heard of uric acid? What is it? It's a waste product. It goes out in your urine, causes what disease? Gout, right, okay? It also causes another disease called hypertension, okay? Uric acid is an important part of hypertension. We have a hypertension epidemic in this country. Here it is. It's the sugar. So why do we care about xylulose 5-phosphate? Well, here's why. Because it stimulates this guy over here called PP2A, which here we've got acyl-CoA, which is the way into fat, Okay, which then gets packaged, sorry, oops, with the VL, to the VLDL, and now you've got the dyslipidemia of obesity, of fructose consumption, which has been known for many years. So here's normal medical students. Taking in a glucose load, notice almost none of it ends up as fat. Taking in a fructose load, same number of calories, 30% of it ends up as fat. So when you consume fructose, you're not consuming a carbohydrate, you're consuming fat. So everybody talks about a high-fat diet? Well, a high-sugar diet is a high-fat diet. That's the point. That's exactly the point. The, some of the fat won't make it out of the liver, just like with ethanol, and now you've got a lipid droplet, so now you've got this non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Some of it will come out as free fatty acids and populate the muscle, We'll also tell the insulin to go up higher. Remember that junk one? So here's what junk one does. So the acyl-CoA and the fructose can all activate junk one. And what junk one does is, remember when we used glucose, this IRS became tyrosine IRS one, and that was good? Remember that? Well, junk one, what it does is it serine phosphorylates IRS one. And serine IRS one is inactive. So now the insulin can't even do its job in the liver. So now you have liver insulin resistance as well. That's gonna make the pancreas work that much harder, generating higher insulin levels, which raise your blood pressure even further, cause further fat making, cause more energy to go into your fat cell. There's your obesity, okay? And finally, we've, our research has shown that the higher the insulin goes, the less well your brain can see its leptin. And so there you've got continued consumption because your brain thinks it's starving. And it's been shown in many different uh, ways that fructose consumption changes the way your brain recognizes energy, all in a negative fashion, so that you basically think you're starving. Your brain gets the signal that you're starving even though your fat cells are generating a set signal that says, hey, I'm full like all get out. So the high insulin generates the obesity because this is that, remember that first, the, the first law of thermodynamics, the biochemical force generating the, the energy uh, storage as the primary phenomenon, remember? If, you, uh, if you're gonna store it and you expect to burn it, then you're gonna have to eat it. So here's the store it. Normally, that would make leptin and the leptin should feed back and turn everything off, but it doesn't because the insulin gets in the way, and the high-fat diet gets in the way. Also, the hyperinsulinemia stops the leptin from uh, acting on that nucleus accumbens, and so you get an increased reward signal. So that continues your appetite, continues more fructose, more carbohydrate, generating more insulin resistance, and you can see you generate a vicious cycle of consumption and disease, and non no stopping. 
So here we are. Hypertension, inflammation, hepatic insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, dyslipidemia, muscle insulin resistance, obesity, and continued consumption. Looks like metabolic syndrome to me. So here are the phenomena associated with chronic ethanol exposure. Here's fructose, eight out of 12. Why? Because they do the same thing, because they're metabolized the same way, because they are the same. They come from the same place. Here's our clinic intervention. We have four things we teach the kids to do, and the parents. Get rid of every sugared liquid in the house, bar none. Only water and milk, okay? There is no such thing as a good sugar beverage, period. Eat your carbohydrate with fiber. Why? Because fiber is good. Fiber is supposed to be an essential nutrient. And we can talk later, if you want, after the cameras turn off, as to why fiber is not an essential nutrient, because the government doesn't want it to be, okay? Because then they couldn't sell food abroad. Wait 20 minutes for second portions, okay? To get that satiety signal, and finally, Buy your screen time minute for minute with physical activity. That's the hardest one to do. We follow our patients every three months. So here's my question. Does it work? What do you think? Yeah, it works. Okay. So this is BMI Z score, time from initial visit. It works. But we were interested in what made it work and what made it didn't work. So we did a multivariate linear regression analysis, right? The thing that made it not work, sugared beverage consumption. The more sugar beverages the patients drank at baseline, the less well the lifestyle intervention worked for all the reasons I just showed you, okay? So why is exercise important in obesity? Because it burns calories? Come on. 20 minutes of jogging is one chocolate chip cookie. You can't do it. Are you joking me? So why is exercise important? Number one, it improves that skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity because your insulin actually works better at your muscle, okay, which then brings your insulin levels down, which is good for you. Number two, it's your endogenous stress reducer. It's the single thing that actually stress reduces. And if you stress reduce, what do you think your appetite does? Goes down because stress and obesity go hand in hand, right? For all sorts of reasons which are beyond the scope of this lecture today, but we can talk about in the question period if you want. And then finally, remember that de novo lipogenesis? Remember those three nasty enzymes? Okay, what if you burned the stuff off before you made the fat? That's what exercise does, because it makes that TCA cycle run faster, so you don't get the citrate leaving the mitochondria, so it doesn't get turned into fat, so it doesn't precipitate and cause all the problems you just saw. That's what they mean by a higher metabolism, yes. Okay? But it has nothing to do with burning of calories. That is the stupidest reason that I've ever heard of for exercise. You gotta be joking me. Okay? You can't do it. I mean, one Big Mac, you know, and you've got to, you know, mountain bike for 10 hours. <laughs> Are you joking? <laughs> okay, so why is fiber important in obesity? God made the poison, he packaged it with the antidote, okay? Because fructose is a poison. I think I've hopefully shown you that, okay? But wherever there's fructose in nature, there's way more fiber. Do you ever see a piece of sugar cane? It's a stick, <laughs> right? You can't even chew the damn thing, right? You gotta suck the stuff out, like that, right? I mean, how many calories do you think you're gonna get out of a piece of sugar cane? That's why fruit's okay. Because number one, it limits how much fructose you're gonna take in, and number two, it gives you an essential nutrient which you needed in the first place, and you get some micronutrients along with it. Number one, it reduces the rate of intestinal carbohydrate absorption, okay? Now, sometimes that's bad. Okay, so as far as I'm concerned, in life, you've got two choices. It's either fat, or fart. It increases the speed of transit of the intestinal contents to the ileum, okay? And that raises this hormone over here called PYY, which goes to your brain and tells you the meal's over. That's your satiety signal. So when you add fiber to your diet, you actually get your satiety signal sooner because the food moves through faster. And then finally, it also inhibits the absorption of some free fatty acids all the way to the colon, and then those get chopped up into little itty-bitty fragments called short-chain fatty acids, and those actually suppress insulin as opposed to long-chain fatty acids which stimulate insulin. So there are a whole bunch of reasons why fiber is good. Okay, now for some fun. 
Okay, that's the end of the biochemistry. Whew. How'd I do? <laughs> now comes the fun part, okay? The racial innuendos and the, uh, you know, all, all the political stuff, okay? The fructosification of America and, of course, the world. Ready? Can you name the seven foodstuffs at McDonald's that don't have high fructose corn syrup or sucrose? If you don't add the sugar and iced tea, if you don't add the sugar. By the way, the Chicken McNuggets have, you know, we have a disclaimer because no one eats the Chicken McNuggets without the dipping sauce. And there's a whole bunch of high fructose corn syrup in the dipping sauce, right? Okay, good. All right, so who's really drinking this? Do you think there are any elite athletes who actually drink this stuff? You gotta be kidding me. Okay, this is for kids. 130 calories, 15 of them are sugars because it's lactose, right, which is okay. And here's Berkeley Farms 1% chocolate milk. 190 calories, 29 grams of sugar, all high fructose corn syrup. Okay? It's like a glass of milk plus a half a glass of orange juice. Okay, and that's what we're giving to our kids. And you know what the you know what the, uh, the nutrition department at the SFUSD says? Well, we have to get our kids to drink milk somehow. Now, is that, is, that, is that brilliant or what? I don't know. So remember what we started with? We have an epidemic of obese six-month-olds. So could this be the reason? So here's a can of formula. 43.2% corn syrup solids, 10.3% sugar. It's a baby milkshake. Okay, here we got a can of Coke. Here we got a can of beer. And I'm not picking on Schlitz or anything. I mean, it's you know, any beer you want, okay? So when you actually compute the number of calories hit in the liver, which, remember, was the big difference between glucose and fructose, remember? 72 versus 24, and started the whole thing into motion as terms of what happens that's bad, okay? Bottom line, no difference. Fructose is ethanol without the buzz. Fructose is a carbohydrate, yes, it is. But fructose is metabolized like a fat. And I've just shown you that 30% of any ingested fructose load ends up as fat. So the corollary to that is, in America at least, and around the world too, a low-fat diet isn't really a low-fat diet. Because the fructose or sucrose doubles as fat, it's really a high-fat diet. What can we do about it? How about the FDA? You think they can do something about it. So I want to just show you what the tobacco company thinks of all this. It is required that additives be safe, defined as a reasonable certainty by competent scientists that no harm will result from the intended use of the additive. Now, does fructose meet that standard? Well, the FDA says that fructose, high fructose corn syrup, has what's known as GRAS, G-R-A-S status, generally regarded as safe. Now, where'd that come from? Nowhere. Keeping on going. A food shall be deemed to be adulterated if it bears or contains any poisonous or deleterious substance which may render it, render it injurious to health. Fructose hit, fits that description, right? Uh-uh. But not with the prevention of chronic diseases, even though its own regulations explicitly postulate the connection between such products and such diseases. In other words, the FDA will only regulate acute toxins, not a chronic toxin. Fructose is a chronic toxin, right? Acute fructose exposure did nothing, remember? Because the brain doesn't metabolize fructose. The liver does. And the liver doesn't get sick after one fructose meal. It gets sick after a thousand fructose meals. But that's how many we eat. So the FDA isn't touching this. The USDA isn't touching this. Because if the USDA touched this, what would that mean? That would mean an admission to the world that our food is a problem. Okay, because their job is to sell food. And who's eating it? We are. So, in summary, fructose, and I don't care what the vehicle is, it's irrelevant, sucrose or high fructose corn syrup, I don't care. Fructose consumption's increased in the past 30 years, coinciding with the obesity epidemic. A calorie is not a calorie, okay? And the dietitians in this country are actually perpetrating this on us. Because the more you think a calorie is a calorie, the more you think, well, then if you ate less and exercised more, it would work. It doesn't. 
All of the studies show it doesn't work. Here's why it doesn't work, because a calorie is not a calorie. Fructose is not glucose. We know a calorie is not a calorie because there are good fats and bad fats. There's good protein and bad protein. Okay, there's good carbohydrate and bad carbohydrate. And glucose is good carbohydrate. Glucose is the energy of life. Fructose, okay, is poison. You are not what you eat. You are what you do with what you eat. And what you do with fructose is particularly egregious and dangerous. Hepatic fructose metabolism leads to all the manifestations of the metabolic syndrome. Fructose ingestion interferes with obesity intervention, as we showed in our clinic. The more soft drinks, the less well diet and exercise actually worked. Fructose is a chronic hepatotoxin for the same reason that alcohol is. The only difference is alcohol is metabolized by the brain, so you get alcohol effects. Fructose is not metabolized by the brain, so you don't get those effects, but everything else it does is the same. But the FDA can't and won't regulate it. It's up to us. I'm standing here today to recruit you. With that, I want to thank my colleagues at the UCSF Department of Pediatrics in our Weight Assessment for Teen and Child Health Clinic, UCSF Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, and also Department of Nutritional Sciences at UC Berkeley, in particular Dr. Jean-Marc Schwartz, who is a card-carrying fructose biochemist, PhD biochemist, who vetted all of these pathways that I've shown you today and looked at this and said, oh my God, it is a toxin. He worked in this stuff for 15 years, and he didn't even realize it was a toxin until he saw this. So with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thank you.